The Conservatives win the general election. They've defied the polls, winning an outright majority in the House of Commons. In the last few minutes, David Cameron has arrived back at 10 Downing Street to begin his second term as Prime Minister, declaring he would govern for all the UK. Together, we can make Great Britain greater still. But it was a disastrous night for Labour and the Liberal Democrats. In the wake of their defeat, Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg and UKIP's Nigel Farage have all resigned their party leaderships. But it was a stunning night for the SNP. It took all but three seats in Scotland and its former leader is returning to Westminster. The Scottish lion has roared this morning across the country. We'll be assessing the new political landscape of the United Kingdom. This afternoon on BBC London, the Lib Dem meltdown in London leaves them with only one MP, their biggest names defeated. And we'll also have a full roundup of the results in London with a reaction and analysis too. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to BBC News from Westminster, where David Cameron has just returned to 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister after one of the most dramatic nights in British political history. The Conservatives have defied all the pundits and won a majority of MPs in Parliament. In the wake of the results, Labour's Ed Miliband, the Liberal Democrats' Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage of UKIP have all resigned as their party's leader. So, with just a handful of seats still to declare, the Conservatives have 328 MPs, 23 more than at the last election. Labour have 232, a loss of 26. The Scottish National Party won all but three of the 59 seats in Scotland, and it was a terrible night for the Liberal Democrats. They now have just eight MPs. The Democratic Unionist Party won eight seats in Northern Ireland and others took 15, including three for Plaid Cymru and one each for UKIP and the Green Party. Well, the Conservatives took almost 37% of the vote, with Labour close to 31%. UKIP took 13%, but their leader failed to win a seat. The Liberal Democrats lost almost two-thirds of their 2010 support, receiving just 8%. We'll be getting all the reaction to the results from our teams across the UK. First, here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright, with the story of an extraordinary general election night. Decisive, clear-cut, emphatic. This was a sensational victory for David Cameron, who left Buckingham Palace a short time ago. He will have a second term as Prime Minister. No hung parliament, no haggle for power. Mr Cameron has bucked the pollsters and delighted his party. Everything I've seen over the last five years, and indeed during this election campaign, has proved once again that this is a country with unrivaled skills and creativeness, a country with such good humor and such great compassion. And I'm convinced that if we draw on all of this, then we can take these islands with our proud history and build an even prouder future. Together, we can make Great Britain greater still. The political shockwaves of this Tory majority have been huge. Labour's Ed Miliband believed the keys to number 10 were within reach, but it was a devastating defeat. He will stand down as the leader this afternoon and had this message for his party. You're the most loyal, supportive, amazing people. I thank all of you today. I am truly sorry I did not succeed. I've done my best for nearly five years. Now you need to show your responsibility. Your responsibility, not simply to mourn our defeat, but to pick yourself up and continue the fight. We've come back before and this party will come back again. And across Westminster, a second party leader resigned. But there were cheers of defiance and support for a shattered Nick Clegg. Clearly the results have been immeasurably more crushing and unkind than I could ever have feared. For that, of course, I must take responsibility 
and therefore I announce that I will be resigning as leader of the Liberal Democrats. This is a very dark hour for our party, but we cannot and will not allow decent liberal values to be extinguished overnight. This is when the night's drama began, seconds after the polls closed. We are saying the Conservatives are the largest party. Hardly anyone predicted that. The Tories looked set to beat Labour into a distant second place and the Liberal Democrats appeared doomed. The party's former leader didn't believe it. If this exit poll is right, Andrew, I will publicly eat my hat on your programme. Labour's troubles and the Conservatives' triumph soon began to unfold in counts across the country. Take Nuneaton, a top Labour target, just before 2am, a sign of things to come. The Conservative Party held it comfortably, as it did dozens of seats Labour hoped to win in England. And then, long after dawn, the most jaw-dropping result of all. 18,776. <laughs> Ed Balls, the architect of an economic policy roundly rejected by voters, was himself thrown out. Any personal um, disappointment I have at this result is as nothing compared to the sense of sorrow I have at um, the result that Labour has achieved across the United Kingdom. Labour losses in Scotland were expected, but it was a wipeout. The SNP took every Labour seat bar one. Douglas Alexander had hoped to be Labour's Foreign Secretary today. Instead, he was beaten by a 20-year-old SNP student. Nicola Sturgeon's party has destroyed Labour's Scottish heartland in a rout that saw the SNP take 56 of Scotland's 59 seats. This was a vote to make Scotland's voice heard loudly at Westminster. Scotland voted for that yesterday and it's now the job of the SNP to represent those who voted for us and to represent those who didn't to make Scotland's voice heard. Liberal Democrat MPs were also dispatched with brutal efficiency by the SNP. Danny Alexander gone. Charles Kennedy, gone. It was the same in England and Wales. Nick Clegg clung on to his seat, but dozens of others did not. It's the SNP that now replaces the Liberal Democrats as the third largest party here at Westminster. And this election proves how wide the political chasm now is between Scotland and the rest of the Union, with potentially huge consequences for how Parliament and the United Kingdom are run. Across Britain, UKIP won many more votes than the SNP, but took just a single seat. The party's leader, Nigel Farage, failed to win in South Thanet and said the electoral system was broken. This morning he quit, but might come back. There will be a leadership election uh, for the next leader of UKIP in September, and I will consider, over the course of this summer, whether to put my name forward to do that job again. This election revealed the UK's fractured politics. And back in Downing Street, David Cameron said he would lead as a one-nation prime minister, recognising there are big divisions to bridge. But now the Conservatives will govern alone. Ahead, five more years of David Cameron at number 10. Ben Wright, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as we were hearing, the SNP achieved a historic landslide general election victory in Scotland, taking 56 out of the 59 seats. Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives have all been left with just one MP each. Our Scotland correspondent, Laura Bicker, is in Glasgow. Laura. Well, Scotland hasn't just changed the way it's voted. It appears to have shifted its views. Scots may have voted no in the independence referendum, but the two-year process allowed them to ask themselves the question, what could or what should Westminster do for me? And the party they've chosen to represent them is one that promised change. I must warn you that my report contains some flash photography. 26,773. Alex Salmond, Scottish National Party, SNP, 27,700. There are words to go with these vast numbers. Landslide, wipeout, avalanche. But the former SNP leader, Alex Salmond, had this to say. It is an extraordinary statement of intent from the people of Scotland. The Scottish lion has roared this morning across the country. His successor, Nicola Sturgeon, at the Glasgow count, was cautiously hopeful. Her party have never won a seat in the city in a general election. They now have all seven. Gender balance, can you? Yes. Yes. Glasgow North East was one with the largest swing ever recorded in the UK. 
Even those who fought for this found it overwhelming. Stunning. Stunning. Look at what you know. Look at what you know. Can you see? I wonder if anybody had a plan for this. The tide was too much for the Labour Party. Stony faced, grimly resigned, they were swept aside. Even their Scottish leader could not hold on. Scotland has woken to a Clyde which no longer runs red. Labour has been humiliated in a city and a country it has dominated for decades. But there are to be no more resignations for now. This morning as the sun rose, we were hurting. But in the morning, just like this, before too long, we will bounce back. And we will again be the change that working people in Scotland and across the UK need. <laughs> Scotland has spoken decisively. The question is, will its voice now be heard in a UK Parliament as promised? Well, within the last half an hour, David Cameron has promised to devolve more powers to the Scottish Parliament, including taxation powers. Now, the SNP still say that will not be enough, but how they'll fight for more on the opposition benches, well, we'll have to wait and see. Jane. Laura, thank you. Laura Bicker. So, Ed Miliband has resigned as Labour leader after his dream of entering number 10 was shattered on a devastating night for the party. Uh, it performed worse than in 2010. The shadow chancellor, Ed Balls, headed a list of high-profile casualties. Mr Miliband said he took absolute and total responsibility for the party's defeat. Our political correspondent, Eleanor Garnier, reports. It was a dismal night. Bitter disappointment and among the tears, cries of a catastrophic election for Labour. A whole generation of its key politicians fell, wiped out in Scotland, rebuffed across England. Tragic result for Labour and it, the most depressing since 92 and the most unexpected since 92. We lost our working class core vote during the new Labour years because we didn't give good jobs to working class people, we didn't build homes for their kids and we can't claw it back by going back down that Blair Road again. But as some Labour grandees blame Blair and New Labour for Ed Miliband's failure, many believe his campaign did go better than expected. His personal performances applauded. That's good. So why did it go so wrong? First of all, fear of the SNP and the left-wing SNP in much of England. Uh, lack of comp trust in Labour on the economy and still Ed Miliband. His ratings improved, but they are still much below David Cameron's in terms of competence. It's little short of a calamity for Labour. And with Ed Miliband gone, the question clearly turns to what next. But some say simply changing the leader won't fix it. What's needed is wholesale change. If the ship is going in the wrong direction, then no matter what the abilities of a new captain would be, man or woman, uh, we'll get the same result again. But who are some of the new faces ready to step forward? From Labour's front bench, the more well-known like Yvette Cooper or Chuka Amuna, the shadow business secretary. Could it be a relative unknown like the Barnsley Central MP Dan Jarvis? After the shock of such a shattering defeat, the soul-searching begins, not just for Ed Miliband, but for the party he'd hoped to take into government. Ellen Agania, BBC News, Westminster. So let's see how the new House of Commons will look. Jeremy Vine is in the BBC's virtual chamber. We have just one result to go, so we're giving you a really, really stable set of numbers here. Let me show you first the government benches, and we bring on the governing party, the Conservatives, 331. Remember, you need to cross the line, 326 seats to govern with an overall majority. They have done that. They have a majority of 12 seats, and you can see David Cameron, the Prime Minister there, secure in the knowledge that he can govern alone. At the last election in 2010, it was different. They were here. They didn't have an overall majority. They had, had to have the help of the Liberal Democrats. Not so this time. The opposition, all of them, on the other benches. Starting here with Labour. 232 seats for Labour. Down 26. All of their seats in. A terrible result for Labour. And Ed Miliband won't be spending any more time on the front benches. Leadership now for somebody else. But so many stories tonight. The Conservative victory this extraordinary Labour defeat which 
takes them back even before 2010, even further back than Gordon Brown was. Also the SNP, have a look at this. So the SNP came into this election with just six MPs. They've added 50, quite remarkable, and it will change the complexion of Westminster. But the Lib Dems, in reverse, have gone down nearly 50, down 49 to eight MPs. So they have their own particular crisis to handle after a nightmare 24 hours. As for the other MPs, let's have a quick look at them as well. Plaid Cymru on three, staying roughly where they were. The Greens on one. UKIP having a new MP at a general election for a first time. And the others, Northern Ireland parties, on 18. So a sensational election result. And this is how it looks, with the Conservatives in charge, but that majority looking very slender. Jeremy, thank you, Jeremy Vine. Well, let's get reaction from the three Westminster Party headquarters. In a moment, we'll hear from Lucy Manning, who's with Labour, and Vicky Young, who's with the Liberal Democrats. First, though, let's talk to our correspondent, Gavin Hewitt, who's been following the Conservatives throughout this campaign. And can they really believe it, Gavin? Well, I think it's fair to say that nobody in the Tory campaign expected a result like this. The most optimistic were talking about perhaps getting 295 seats or even 300. But their election guru spoke of the importance of the last 72 hours. And David Cameron was relentless on message. Don't gamble with the economic recovery. Don't allow in Labour propped up by the SNP. So David Cameron now has immense authority but a tiny majority, but it's sure to be tested, not least with the EU referendum. Now here's Lucy Manning, who's been with the Labour campaign. Well, the tears wouldn't stop flowing. The Labour Party staff members just couldn't hold them back as Ed Miliband announced his resignation just over an hour ago. I mean, remember, this was the man who yesterday thought he was in with a chance of being Prime Minister. But overnight, he lost most of the party's seats in Scotland. He lost two key shadow cabinet members. He lost the fight against the Tories in the key marginals, and he lost any chance he had to govern. Why did it happen? Well, Scotland, of course, but also two nights ago, I said I thought they had concentrated on a message to the core Labour vote. A Labour aide said to me afterwards, that's not right. That means we will lose. He just came up to me now and said, you were right. So for Ed Miliband, a crushing defeat. He is gone. It will be up to the new leader to try and rebuild the party. Now my colleague Vicky Young, who is with the Liberal Democrats. And they are a party who have been totally devastated and stunned by the sheer nature of this defeat. They knew they were going to lose seats, but they had not predicted the turmoil and the extent of it. Uh, they talked five years ago, Nick Clegg, about a new kind of politics as he decided that controversial decision to take the party into government for the first time with the Conservatives. Well, it seems that coalition has totally crushed them. They, as the junior partner, seem to have taken the blame for the things that went wrong and have taken none of the credit for the things that went well. Now, many say that Nick Clegg's leadership will be uh, judged by history to be far better and to be far kinder than the voters have been today, but that is no consolation for this party that now has to have a leadership contest, pick itself up and try to rebuild. Back to Jane. Vicky, thank you. Vicky, Lucy and Gavin. And let's get the thoughts of our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, who's in Downing Street, been following all the events overnight. And Norman, absolutely extraordinary. No other word for it. We really, really didn't expect this outcome. Jane, I've covered more elections than I really should have, but I have to say last night truly was an epic and extraordinary election where in the space of 24 hours the whole political landscape has been recast. A cast list of household names just thrown overboard. Scotland has become a virtual one-party state and inevitably that will raise questions as to whether we are now on course for another independence referendum, potentially for the breakup of the union. The leaders of the three main opposition parties, Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, Nigel Farage, all resigned within an hour of each other. Labour, a worse defeat than that endured under Gordon Brown. 
The Liberal Democrats reduced to their lowest number of MPs since the party was formed. And for UKIP, now a profound question as to whether they are doomed to decline without their talismanic leader. As for David Cameron, a stunning success. He dragged his party back from the brink of defeat and a possible hung parliament to achieve what only Mrs Thatcher had achieved before, to increase the majority of an incumbent government. But he too now faces a profound challenge. How does he bind this country together? His answer, one nation conservatism and the offer of more devolution for Scotland, the hope perhaps of a return to compassionate conservatism, the hope that that may bind together a nation after a very divisive and in the end bloody election. Norman, thank you. Norman Smith in Downing Street. And just one other story to tell you about this lunchtime. Events are being held across Europe to mark 70 years since Allied powers formally accepted the surrender of Nazi Germany, bringing the Second World War in Europe to an end. In Paris, the US Secretary of State John Kerry joined the French President François Hollande at the Arc de Triomphe in a sign of appreciation for the American role in liberating France from German occupation. And just to remind you, you can watch the special service of remembrance at the Cenotaph in London here on BBC One. That begins uh, quite soon. That starts at half past two this afternoon. Now, though, uh, let's find out what the weather has in store. Sarah Keith Lucas can tell us. Hello, Sarah. Hello there, Jane. Well, of course, it is 70 years ago today since VE Day. And on this day, 70 years ago, we had some rain heading in from the west. And similarly, today, we've got some rain moving in from the west. This is the radar picture. It shows it's already raining across parts of Wales into the southwest of England as well. This area of rain will nudge its way further northwards through the remainder of the afternoon. But I think it should stay dry in London. Of course, we've got that service of remembrance at the Cenotaph later on this afternoon. But some pretty wet weather right through the central slice of the UK. To the north of that, some sunnier skies for parts of Scotland, a dry day to come for parts of Northern Ireland as well. Could get one or two showers towards the south, temperatures up to around about 18 degrees or so. Now through the latter part of the afternoon and the evening, the rain nudges its way further northwards and eastwards and overnight tonight eventually we'll lose the main bulk of rain out into the North Sea but we're left with quite a lot of low clouds, some drizzly showers around too and a few spots of mist and fog first thing. Could be just a touch of frost for the north of Scotland under the clear skies. Elsewhere we start the day tomorrow on a mild note but also pretty grey as well first thing. There will be some brightness around, especially for Scotland and Northern Ireland. A few showers for England and Wales, but by the afternoon, those showers tending to ease away, something a little bit brighter. So a slowly improving day and temperatures between around 10 in Aberdeen to 18 or perhaps 19 towards London. Through into the second half of the weekend, what we're going to see is high pressure building from the near continent. But that meets low pressure trying to push in from the Atlantic. So some tightening ice of ours ahead of that. So quite a breezy day to come across Northern Ireland and Scotland. Cloudy here with some outbreaks of rain. For England and Wales, though, not a bad day at all by Sunday. Sunny spells, largely dry and 19 or 20 degrees the top temperature. There is a sign that things may warm up a little bit more as we head towards the early part of next week. But for now, it's back to Jane in Westminster. Sarah, thank you very much, Sarah Keith Lucas. And just a reminder of our top story this lunchtime. The Conservatives win the general election. They've defied the polls, winning an outright majority in the House of Commons. And that is all from us now on BBC One. It's time for the news wherever you are. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, I'm Assad Ahmed. Well, as you've been hearing, it's been a devastating general election for the Liberal Democrats, and they now only have one MP left in London. They lost six seats here and four government ministers in the process. For Labour, there are significant gains, but not as many as they had hoped for. The Tories made some gains, but overall, they are, they're a seat down since the last election. With a roundup of uh, what's been going on, here's our political correspondent, Col Mercer. How do you think you've done tonight? Are you going to win? It could hardly have been a worse night for the Lib Dems in London. One after another, their big names fell. Vince Cable, Simon Hughes, Ed Davey, Lynn Featherstone, Paul Burstow, all gone. Now, how do the Lib Dems, yourself and the Lib Dems, pick yourselves up, though? I mean, across the board, it's, been, it's going to be a bad night. Oh, you've, the party you've, and you've, yourself. You've worked that one out, have you? It's a bad night, yeah, we've worked that one out. Um, uh, and, um, well, let's reflect. I mean, um, we're all, we are a little shocked because we... Our figures were suggesting that we're going to do a lot better. I, it does seem to me that it was a very much a late swing. 
which the p polls hadn't picked up. Simon Hughes lost to Labour's newcomer Neil Coyle, beaten after 32 years as Southwark's MP. And to the people of Bermondsey and Southwark, I have to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. You could not ever, ever have given a greater opportunity, and I hope you think, for 32 years I have served you well. Thank you very much. Tom Brake is now the Lib Dems' last man standing in the capital. He believes the party lost supporters after going into coalition with the Tories. Those people will not support a party that has been in, in government, which they now perceive as being an establishment party. So we've got to go back to our grassroots, rely on our local activists, uh, build up from, from the bottom upwards and ensure that we start to, to, to regain some of the seats that we have lost. His party had lost to the Tories in the suburban southwest to Labour in its three inner city seats. They won here in Ealing Central and here in Enfield North, where former MP Joan Ryan was re-elected. It's good to be back. Ilford North and Brentford also turned red. We've just won Ilford uh, North, so I'm yeah. feeling rather cheery about and we're actually, you know, we're not doing well in the country. We're doing better in London. Uh, and I think that's in part because of the way in which we Labour Party campaigns in London. To have won a bellwether London-Essex border seat on a big swing like this, on a night like this, I'm completely over the moon and all the work that we've put in in recent weeks will be repaid through hard work in the next five years. Overall, Labour picked up seven seats. They had hoped for more. Jane Ellison is duly elected. But the Tories held off challenges in places like Battersea, Harrow, Finchley, Hendon and in Croydon Central, where Gavin Barwell won the seat by 165 votes. I think you have to work really hard as the MP to reach out to the people that didn't vote for you, not just sort of celebrate the fact that you've won, and that's what I'm going to be doing. My experience is that there are lots of people here in this town who are naturally Conservative in their values, but they don't vote for the Conservative Party. David Cameron has done a lot to bring some of those people into our column, but there's a lot more to do over the next five years. Boris Johnson, the Conservative Party candidate, 22,511. And of course, there was another Conservative elected back to the House of Commons, London's Mayor winning a second job in Uxbridge and talking up his party's performance on the night. Obviously, it is a very, very clear victory for the Conservatives and a very bad night for Labour. So a night when the blue and red corners of London will both claim victories of sorts, but a night when the yellow team became a solo act. Carl Mercer, BBC London News. So those are some of the losses and gains, but when you put the information on a map of London, what does it look like? Here's Alex Bushell. Well, first of all, let's bring in the political map going into this general election. These are the results of the 2010 election. You can see I'm standing in the Labour heartlands with a strong southwest presence for the Lib Dems here in the city. Um, what does that mean, though, in terms of the number of seats per political party? Well, if we bring in the numbers, you can see that the Labour Party had 10 more seats than the Conservatives coming into this election, with the Lib Dems on seven. That was then. This is now. You can see Labour have stretched their lead. They hold 45 out of a total of 73 seats here in the city. The Conservatives more or less the same down one. But it's the Lib Dems who have had a catastrophic failure with just a single MP now here in the city. Let's bring in now the change of seats, those that have been taken from other parties. You can see where Labour have done particularly well with seats like Ilford North here where they've seen a 6% swing from Conservatives to Labour. If we move further west, we can see other notable gains, including Ealing Central, where there was a majority overturned of 3,700, again, from Conservatives to Labour. And if we move down into the southwest, we can see some very notable victories. This time, the political scalp of Vince Cable, the business secretary, his seat of Twickenham, he's lost that to the Conservatives with a whopping 11% swing. Let's bring in all the seats held to get an overall sense of the picture and you can see that the Conservatives have done well, particularly in the southwest, but also in the outer boroughs. But it's good news particularly for Labour. It may have been a disappointing night nationally for them, but it's been very good news here in London. And as a result of Labour gains, we can say that from Hayes in the west all the way through to Dagenham in the east, we can walk the length of London in Labour-held territory. 
Well, from the situation in London to a look at the surrounding counties. If we start with what it was like five years ago, we see the Tories dominating in all but three seats. Now let's see how that's changed overnight. Well, the answer, as you can tell, not at all. The map's still pretty much all blue, except those three Labour seats of Luton South, Luton North and Slough. Well, of course, you should expect uh, politics dominating the news today, but elsewhere, let me just tell you, there will be a two-minute silence at three o'clock to mark VE Day. Elizabeth has a forecast for it and a forecast from the past too. 